Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. We'll start here in about two minutes. I've got 10.58 Central. We'll start promptly at 11 a.m. All right, everybody, I got uh, right at 11 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar. Um, I understand that uh, time is your most precious commodity, so I want to make this an incredible use of your time. Just for our attendees to know, uh, the webinar is only going to take about 40 to 45 minutes uh, to go through. I'm going to be opening up at uh, somewhere between 1140 and 1145 Central, uh, to take questions. We only limited this webinar to 50 people because I wanted y'all to get a lot out of it and be able to answer and address any questions that you might have. Um, if you don't have pen and paper handy or something to write with, I highly recommend that you do so. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first and foremost, with this webinar, there's going to be no fluff whatsoever. I'm not going to go into my background or any type of salesmanship or anything like that. I'm just going to go ahead and just give you the facts uh, because at the end of the day, all you care about is getting four new clients in six weeks. So what we're going to go through today is I'm going to show you the five components necessary to make that happen. Um, everything that we're going to go through is going to be at a very, um, uh, a very detailed level, but not so much detail that it's going to overwhelm you. I'm just going to basically give you uh, the facts and uh, you'll basically have uh, enough information to either uh, execute this yourself or be able to find somebody that can uh, help you execute it. Uh, because at the, end of the, I, at the end of the day, I always say to my clients, uh, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the execution or the implementation of those ideas that are by far the most important. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is when it comes to generating uh, uh, or getting four new clients in six weeks, the first principle that we have to keep in mind is that you must know the score. What I mean by knowing the score is you've got to know your numbers. Imagine going to a baseball game or a football game and telling all the players there that uh, you don't know the score, you don't know what quarter or inning it is, uh, you don't know what their batting average is, and you know nothing about the pitch count or you know nothing about how much uh, time is left on the clock. It would be very, very difficult for that team to compete, to say the absolute least. 
So before you go into generating leads or generating sales appointments or closing sales, it's first imperative that you know the major stats of your existing business. So here are some of those existing stats. So the first thing that you want to absolutely know is what is your previous 12 month revenue uh, or what is your year to date revenue? What we're doing here is we're enacting the principle of whatever gets measured gets done. If you're not measuring the critical success factors of your business, you're not going to know which areas you need to improve upon. So first great place to start is what is your top line revenue? What is your top line revenue for, from January 1st to now? And what is your January or your revenue from the beginning of each month to now? So if you do not know what your revenue number is between the beginning of this year, 2017, and now that's uh, the first number you need to know. The second number you need to know is what are your sales month to date? So that's the first number. The second number to know is your cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold are, are whatever it takes, whether it be manpower or labor material or, or materials, in order to fulfill the service or product that you are selling. It is absolutely imperative to know what the cost of goods sold. And as a result of that, if you take the revenue minus the cost of goods sold, is to know your gross margin. Um, most clients that I actually work with have at least some understanding or some view of their revenue, cost of goods sold, or gross margin. However, I am constantly surprised, constantly surprised how many uh, business owners do not know what their overhead is. Um, I was working with a client of mine that uh, wanted to raise revenue, and we raised the revenue from $250,000 a month to $350,000 a month. And in the very next meeting, I noticed that they were having a cash flow problem. And I said, well, wait a minute. How is it that we've just increased revenue by $100,000 over the last couple of months, yet you're still not making a profit? And they said, I don't know. I was like, what do you mean you don't know? Turns out they had no clue as to how much revenue they had to generate each and every month just to break even. If you don't know how much revenue it takes each and every month just to break even, you're going to be behind the curve. And in addition to that, you're also going to probably have expenses that you don't even know that you're uh, that you're that you're doing that is just basically creating no results for you whatsoever. So you must know what is your total overhead each and every month in order to run your business and to break even, because you'll know that any amount over that amount will be will go down to a straight line profit, which brings me to the next thing. Net profit margin. Net profit margin is simply revenue minus your cost of goods sold, minus the overhead, but before taxes, interest, amortization, and depreciation. So in other words, what that tells you is for every dollar of revenue that you bring in, how much goes down to the bottom line before you pay taxes, interest, amortization, or depreciation. A lot of people in the finance world call it EBITDA. Uh, some people call it net profit margin. It doesn't matter. What you must know is for every dollar that comes in, what percentage of that actually goes down to the bottom line in net profit. Then, which is what we're gonna talk a lot about today, is number of leads generated. Do you know how many leads you need to generate each month or each year in order to help you accomplish your goals? If you don't know that number, rest assured, we're going to go through something called the revenue formula, which walks you through exactly how to calculate how many leads you actually need. Then the conversion rate. Uh, leads are great. Getting business and getting revenue is even better. So the conversion rate is if you've got 10 leads and two of them become clients, you have a 20% conversion ratio. If you track that, you can start asking yourself questions as to what is going to improve upon my lead conversion rates, because a conversion rate is simply what percentage of my total leads actually become customers. And a lot of businesses fail there because they get a lead and they're all excited, but they don't follow up with them. Follow up is by far one of the most important concepts when it comes to business development. And then the last thing is the average sale. When somebody buys your product or service, on average, what is the size of the project? What is the size of the service? On average, every time they ring the register. If you know these eight factors, revenue, cost of goods sold, gross margin, overhead, net profit margin, number of leads to generate, conversion rate and average sale, that then gives you a scorecard of how well your business is doing. And it also kind of gives you a, a, a very clear line of sight 
as to what exactly to focus on in the business. For example, if your revenue numbers are good and you have a good gross margin, but your net profit margin is not where it should be, then check your overhead and start asking questions about, okay, let me look at my P&L and let me find out uh, you know, what are the expenses and what are the results that we're getting for those expenses. If you find that your revenue isn't where you want it to be, then ask yourself, okay, how many leads have we generated? Oh, wow, we've generated a lot of leads. What is our conversion rate? Oh, our conversion rate is only 5%. That's not very good. We need to now check the sales process to find out what is wrong. But by knowing these eight numbers, you'll be able to have a very clear line of sight of what area inside of your business needs the most attention. As far as tracking, people always ask me, how long should I track these? I recommend tracking these weekly, again, to enforce the principle that whatever you check gets done and gets improved upon. So I recommend checking those numbers at least weekly. If you don't have a bookkeeper or CFO or a controller or somebody in your family or anybody to at least be tracking and, and, and submitting to you P&L statements, balance sheet statements, uh, or having a dashboard of what those numbers are on a consistent basis, I highly recommend tracking those weekly. Now, you don't necessarily have to track uh, things like uh, overhead or cost of goods sold uh, on a weekly basis, but I highly recommend you can at least check very simply your revenue, the number of leads generated, and the number of new clients on a weekly basis. That should be very simple and very straightforward to check. The second thing is always check the numbers month to date. Uh, you can check the numbers uh, of, of revenue and, and uh, gross profit and net operating uh, income on a monthly basis. If you don't know what your numbers are on a month-by-month -month basis to where you can compare where your company is compared to where you want it to be, you're not going to know which areas to focus on. And then lastly, of course, is year-to-date, like I just mentioned. What is your revenue year-to-date? What's your profit year-to-date? What's your gross margin year-to-date? How many leads have you gotten year-to-date? Because what that does, more than anything, is it keeps you on track to ensuring that you get to your goals. Because like I said, if, uh, you track, if you track the key metrics in your business, you can actually start focusing on exactly what it is that you want. So uh, very, very important. Do not do anything as far as lead generation or sales or anything like that or optimize anything unless first and foremost you know exactly what these numbers are and track it on a weekly, month, and year-to-date basis. So after you have a clear picture of where your business is now, it's then time to define your 12-month objectives. Objectives. If you're planning a trip to Miami, Florida, or to Disney World, you first start where? You start with where you are right now. So, in, for example, if I'm going from Houston to Walt Disney World or Disney World in Orlando, the first thing I need to start uh, with my, my trip is, yes, I need to know my 12-month objective or my goal, which is getting to Disney World in a set period of time, but I also need to know that I'm in Houston, Texas. So the first step is to know exactly where you are now because you may, not, you may think that you have a revenue problem when really you have a sales conversion problem or a lead generation problem. So first know where you stand right now. So how do you define your 12-month objectives? Well, this is going to look very, very familiar. Uh, it actually looks just like what we just went through, but on a more detailed level. And what I like to use when I'm planning out or helping my clients plan out their next 12 months or next six months, and by the way, the revenue formula that I'm about to show you works at a six-month basis, a 12-month basis, a two-year basis, or a next-month basis. You just want to be consistent with the time frame. So here's a revenue formula. The revenue formula is leads multiplied by the conversion rate, and I'll define all these for you here in just a second, multiplied by the average sale, multiplied by the frequency equals sales. So let me define these different terminologies first so everybody is clear on what this means. Leads is a person or an entity that has come across your value proposition and is interested in learning more about the services and products you can provide. It's not going out there and getting a list of 2,000 vice presidents of operations or CIOs in your marketplace. Those are not leads. Those are what we call suspects. Suspects basically are nothing more than the total composition of all the people that you would like to do business with. A lead is a person or an entity that has come across your value proposition and is interested in learning more. The conversion rate is the percentage in which those leads become customers. Like I said earlier, if you've got 100 leads and 20 become customers, 
your lead conversion rate is 20%, meaning that of every 100 leads that you come across, 20 of them turn into customers. Average sale is simply when somebody rings the register, every time they ring that register or you get paid, what is the average sale? Um, a really easy way to tell that is simply take your previous 12-month revenue and divide it by the average number of clients that you have. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to start, this, uh, to, to start defining your 12-month objective. Frequency is how often each year somebody actually buys from you. So, for example, if you're uh, selling marketing services and you charge $3,000 a month and your average client stays with you for 12 months, then the average sale is $3,000, which is $3,000 per month, multiplied by 12, which is the frequency. So the frequency is how often somebody buys from you. Now, you don't have to get that granular when you're creating your 12-month objective. You can simply say, look, over a one-year period, my client or my customer typically buys $20,000 from me. And then you can just leave the frequency as the number one. So you can make this as easy on yourself or as difficult as on yourself as you want. If you've got a financial background and if you are very meticulous about tracking all of your numbers, then... I would recommend having the average sale be the amount of revenue that you get each time somebody buys from you and the frequency, the average times per year that they buy from you. If you do not have that background, make this simple. Just say, look, on average, uh, my, av my average client pays me X amount per year and they do it one time a year just for planning purposes. And then for sales, that's going to actually be your sales goal. So if your sales goal for the next 12 months is a million dollars, then put a million dollars. If your, average, if your uh, sales goal is $5 million, put $5 million. And then what you want to do is solve this equation for leads. So the number of leads that you need is simply the, the, your sales goal divided by the product of your conversion rate, average sale, and frequency. And this is very important. You want to make sure that you put your conversion rate as a decimal instead of a percentage. So if your conversion rate is 20%, don't put 20, put 0.2. That actually makes the numbers all work out very, very nicely. Because let's say, for example, that you calculate this and you need 240 leads a year. Business owners and people have a much better time tracking activity than they do actually the results. And also, from a psychological standpoint, if you're tracking activity, like the number of leads you need, it actually gets you a better probability of achieving that goal because sometimes having a number with that little dollar sign in front of it just freaks us out. We, just, we start believing that we can't do it. And if we believe we can't do it, it's not going to happen. So you want to solve for leads because then you all, all you have to do is ask yourself the question, did we get 240 leads this year? And you can also break that down per month. Did we get 20 leads, 20 qualified leads this month? And if you did, then that should put you on track to reach your sales objectives. The revenue formula is, is simple and straightforward, but it's a very powerful tool when you're determining how many leads you need to generate in order to grow your sales. Now, there's other ways to grow sales. Uh, for example, as you see from here, it's a multiplication equation, which means that if you make small changes to e either one of these numbers, you can have a logarithmic result. For example, if you increase your conversion rate by optimizing your sales process from 20 to 25%, that makes a significant difference on the amount of sales. Uh, if you start to increase your prices, you know, that, and, and instead of charging you know, that marketing company I was talking about earlier, instead of charging $3,000 a month, if they charge $3,200, that can have a dramatic uh, effect on your sales. Or uh, if your frequency can go higher. In other words, can we offer some other products and services to our existing customer base in order to generate more sales? So it's not just getting new business. It's perhaps remarketing to your existing clients and increasing the amount of value or services that you provide for them to increase sales. So you don't have to go out there and spend tons and tons of money on marketing. It's simply perhaps just making some tweaks to the conversion rate or your prices or the average sale or how often per year you do business with them. This is a great formula. I highly recommend that you use this. Uh, it has made a significant difference in the over 300 clients that we have served. All right. So before I go into the lead generation, I want to first focus on something kind of negative, but I think that we can use this for your benefit to show you what is it that, that makes businesses fail. 
According to a Harvard business study, uh, they came up with a couple of reasons as to why businesses fail. So here's what they came up with. They said that 90% of businesses fail due to, number one, poor leadership. And poor leadership starts with kind of what we just talked about. Where are you now? Where do you want to get to? It's very difficult to lead, which is what your calling is as an entrepreneur, a business owner, an executive. It's very difficult to lead if you don't know where your, where your business stands or where you want it to get to. So that's why we just spent the better part of the last 15 or so minutes talking about defining and knowing where are you now and where do you want to get to. So that's number one is poor leadership. Number two is no differentiation from competitors. Uh, we're going to get into a little, in a little bit something called Glyker's Formula for Change to help you identify and communicate your uniqueness to your marketplace. And the reason why that is so important is that in 2000, I'm just going to let the facts and figures speak for themselves. In 2013, Yahoo Small Business and MIT, I know it's a weird relationship, but just stay with me for a second. So MIT and uh, Yahoo Small Business did a joint venture study together. And what they wanted to determine and figure out and ask the question of what percentage of companies out there do a good job of communicating and delivering or identifying their uniqueness in order to generate leads and to close more sales. So they did a control group of 635 companies across all of the 13 S&P 500 industries, both small, medium, and large. And what they found is that only 2.7% of them actually could articulate and communicate their unique selling proposition or their differentiation from their competitors to the marketplace. What's interesting about that is that if you look at that 2.7% of companies that did, they were by far growing the fastest and the largest companies of those 635. So if you cannot tell people what makes you different and what your value add is, you're gonna have a very, very difficult time growing and scaling your business. And by the way, differentiation it does not mean that you've been around for 20 years, have great service and, and reasonable prices, because nobody's looking for bad service, a brand new company, or really, really uh, extreme prices. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's, that's what we call an assumed feature. You, you know, once somebody uh, buys your services or buys your product, people are going to, or at least they should, automatically assume that the quality is good, that the service is good, and that the price is competitive. So if that's what you're saying to your uh, prospects or to the people that are interested in doing business with you, that might be why you are not getting as much sales as you would like. Third is out of touch with customer needs, which is very close to uh, point number two, which is no differentiation from competitors. If you want to find out why your clients use you or why your customers use them, I know this is going to be absolutely just mind blowing, but the best way to do that is to ask them. Call five, six, or three, I mean, or at least one of your customers and say, look, before you hired us, before you used our product or service, what was your life like? Now, after using our product and service, what is your life like now? And they'll start telling you uh, what it is that their life was before and what it is now. And chances are you can use that golden, almost platinum information to craft your unique selling proposition, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So the fourth point is an unprofitable business model. In other words, they're not checking their numbers. They're not keeping track of the revenue and the overhead and the cost of goods sold and the net profit. And they don't have a business model that is designed for profitability. But again, what does that come down to? It comes to first and foremost, knowing the score and knowing where you stand now. And then it comes to defining your 12 month obje objective using the revenue formula. And then the last one is poor financial management, which we've already talked about. So here are the five things, poor leadership, no differentiation from competitors, out of touch with your customers, unprofitable business model, and poor financial management. That's it, which means if you can master or just even be somewhat good at those five things, you'll be significantly ahead of the curve, especially with your competitors, and you can absolutely dominate your market. So now that we've identified where we are, and where we want to get to, let's now go into some more detail about lead generation. So lead generation has three vital, vital ingredients. The first ingredient is you've got to know your market. Who are your ideal or your best customers? And oftentimes those are who your ideal prospects are going to be. So you can go out there and get a list of those demographics. And one thing that I cannot stress to you enough is that you must choose a niche. 
I, if you're marketing or you can say, look, my, my business, uh, uh, anybody can use my product or service. The problem with saying anybody is that you set yourself up to be a generalist that doesn't give you a competitive advantage and being all things to all people simply does not work. I talked to a recruiting prospect yesterday and he actually specializes in recruiting for the electrical manufacturing business in the United States. So it's like, gosh, how many of those people actually need recruiting services? His business last year generated $24 million in sales just by marketing to, uh, or just by placing uh, people at electro electronic manufacturers. And then what he said next, I thought was brilliant. He goes, Charles, as big as this, I've gotten this business too, which is $24 million, I basically have penetrated maybe, maybe one one thousandth of the market. What I find that so many business owners get stuck in, so many entrepreneurs get stuck in, is they're so excited about their product or service and want to give it to everybody. And when they generate a marketing material, it's not speaking to no one. So you want to define your market. So, and the best way to do that is you want to do an 80-20 analysis of your book of business. 80% of your revenue is only coming from 20% of your customers. Those 20% customers probably have some very, very similar traits and demographics. They probably generate a, a, a range of revenue. They probably have similar employees. You probably go after similar titles or probably located within a specific or a range of geographic locations. So define your market to say, look, our market are chief executive officers of 10 to $50 million businesses in agriculture in Houston, Texas, that have 50 to 100 employees. And you want to make it that specific because that way you can now go get a list of those people and you can start marketing to them. So that's ingredient number one. And that's where you want to start. Don't ever start as should we market our business on Facebook or LinkedIn or Google or whatever. You first want to start the most critical piece of lead generation is to first and foremost to find who is your target market. Because if you don't know who you're speaking to, you can't speak to them. I know that sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but it's true. I cannot speak to the general public, but I can speak specifically to the people that I can help the most. So that's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is to find your message. Uh, what is it, like we just talked about, what is it about your product, your service, that is unique to you that differentiates your, yourself from the competition? Now, a lot of professional services companies that I've worked with in the past will say, well, Charles, you know, a recruiting company is a recruiting company or a financial services company is a financial services company or an engineering company is an engineering company. We all do the same thing. I've worked with over 300 businesses of which I would say probably 40 to 50 of those are engineering firms. I've never met the same engineering firm twice. I've never met the same financial services firm twice. I've never met the same management consulting firm twice because they all do something a little bit different, a little unique that uh, their customers truly value. And having said all that, remember the statistics that I just gave you a couple of minutes ago. Of the 635 companies out there that they was in the control group of that study between MIT and Yahoo, only 2.7% of them could articulate and communicate their value proposition to their competition. Which means this, chances are that 97.3% of your competition all says the exact same thing. So in other words, even though there might be a thousand financial services or accounting firms or recruiting firms or engineering firms or IT outsourcing firms, chances are that 97.3% of them are all saying the same darn thing every single day. So in essence, they have commoditized their market. They've commoditized their, uh, their services and their products. Simply by just saying things that probably everybody does, but they don't want to mention it, probably would give you a significant competitive advantage. I work with this engineering company, and uh, they actually, the reason why they were able to deliver such a high percentage of their, um, of their projects on time and on budget is because they use a project, plan, a project plan. Before every project started, they would have a project plan. And they would make that plan known and available on a daily basis to their clients. So I said, well, why don't you just say that instead of just saying that you're an MEP firm? They said, well, everybody does that. And I was like, it doesn't matter if, anybody's, if everybody does that. The fact of the matter is not everybody is saying that. 
So they started just simply saying, look, the, we have 98% of our projects go on time and on budget because we do not start any project without a project plan and we make it available to all of our clients. And they're experiencing some phenomenal growth. So defining your message and communicating to your customers and to your prospects what makes you different is of paramount importance. And I'm going to give you a tool here in just a second to show you exactly how to do that. So step one is to find your market. Step two is to find your message. And step three is to find your media platform. Ladies and gentlemen, this should be the easiest part of lead generation. Once you know who your target market is, once you know your message, that only comes down to about two or three different marketing platforms that you should communicate your message to your, uh, to your target market. Uh, for example, if you sell a business to business service, chances are Instagram is not going to be a good place to market your services. But LinkedIn or Facebook or speaking or asking for referrals, excuse me, or asking for referrals might be the right way. Most businesses, when they start on the lead generation path, always start with, well, well you know, should we market on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever? You don't know the answer to that question until you first know who your market is until you then know who your message is. And by that, of the 77 different ways you can market your business, it's going to very easily come down to three of them that make the most amount of sense. So those are the three ingredients. So let me walk you through a little bit with something called Gleicher's Formula for Change. So David Gleicher was an economist, a German economist in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, in 1967, he actually won a Pulitzer Prize for the work and the study that he did on change. And what he did it is he did it from a business standpoint. He said, what are the ingredients that makes people change vendors, that makes people change their course in life, that makes people or businesses uh, change direction or change course? And what he found is that there were three variables that always were in place that facilitated that need or motivated a need for a change. So here's the formula. The formula is D as in dog, multiplied by V as in Victor, multiplied by F as in Frank, has to be greater than R. So D times V times F has to be greater than R. So let me walk you through what those mean. D stands for dissatisfaction. There has to be some dissatisfaction with that company for them to be open to a change. Now, there actually are three types of dissatisfaction. There's real dissatisfaction relative dissatisfaction, and created dissatisfaction. Real dissatisfaction is when something so egregious happens, so terrible, that the company has to make a change. Relative dissatisfaction is when things are okay, but they want to make it better. Uh, the problem with the first two types of credit dissatisfaction is that real dissatisfaction and relative dissatisfaction within a market, let's say that you have a market of, of a thousand uh, of a thousand prospects or suspects. So, you have, so your, your list of prospects or excuse me, suspects is a thousand people. Only 5% of those are ever at real dissatisfaction or relative dissatisfaction. So if you're sending a marketing message that is aimed at real dissatisfaction or relative dissatisfaction, only five or excuse me, yes, only 5% of your market is going to be open to having a further conversation with you. So my favorite is created dissatisfaction when you provide your customers and prospects a new insight about how you can make their life better that they have not considered before. And because you are the expert at your own business, you always are going to have a competitive advantage over your suspects, which means that you're going to you have a competitive advantage over creating leads because you know your business inside and out, whereas the people that you're looking to do business with don't. That's why they're hiring you or that's why you're using the product or using your product. So D is dissatisfaction. V stands for vision. You have to be able to give, your, within your marketing pieces, you've got to be able to communicate what their future state is going to look like by making the change to doing business with you. For example, you can say that uh, you'll be able to make more money or you'll be able to scale your business or you'll be able to have exponential growth or you'll be able to have better engineering drawings, or you'll be able to be able to find the right people for your business in half the time that it takes you now. So you've got to, you've got to be able to paint in the minds and hearts of your suspects and the people that you go wanting to do business with a very clear picture of what business is going to be like doing business with you versus what would happen if they continue on their current course. So that's V. 
F stands for first steps. And if I could quantify this, it's an easy first step. If they have to move heaven and earth to make this change, then they're not going to make that change. You want to give them a very easy first step, a 15-minute phone call. Uh, hey, go to my website and download a white paper. Hey, let me send you some information on how we can make your life better. Or maybe a case study on this is what, what the case was with the client before I did business with them. This is where they are now. And look, wow, uh, it's an amazing difference. Don't you agree? So first steps could simply be providing them a case study on how you've added value for similar businesses in the past. And all of those have to add up to, or excuse me, multiply greater than someone's resistance to change. Now, one thing that we can observe from a high level with this formula is the fact that it is a multiplication equation. It's D times V times F has to be greater than R. So if somebody is dissatisfied and have a vision of what their life could be like by doing business with you versus somebody else, if they don't know the first step to take or if it's too complicated, they're not going to make that change because F, the F variable, is zero. Or somebody can be dissatisfied and know the first step to take, but really not have a vision as to how their life would look better uh, in the future. So my clients often ask me, Charles, are you telling me that if I can communicate dissatisfaction, a clear vision, and an easy first step that they're guaranteed to change? My answer is it's not guaranteed to change, but it definitely gives you a significant edge over your competition. But here's what I can guarantee. If you cannot create dissatisfaction and give them a clear picture of what their life could be using your services versus not using your service, and you can, or you can, do not give them an easy first step, I guarantee you they're not going to change. Because if any one of those factors are zero, either dissatisfaction, vision, or first steps, or a combination of those three, your chances of getting a lead are zero, absolute zero. So that is a really simple way that our clients have used to be able to really craft how to communicate and articulate your differentiating factors. Because the buyer's journey is this. The first thing that a buyer wants to know is why should I buy? Why should I buy categorically your product or service? That's the first question we have to, we have to answer in their minds. The second question is why shouldn't I buy? Uh, I, I've always defined sales as finding out what somebody wants and then giving it to them. I have never defined sales as pushing a product or a service on somebody. And there are certain people that are not best suited to use your products and services. And there's people that are not suited to use my products and services. So being able to show them or articulate to them why should they buy or why they should not buy are the first two questions that you must answer in order to generate leads and to follow up with those leads. And then once you've satisfied those two questions and they believe that they need your product or service, then they're going to ask the question, who should I buy from? And again, if you use Glycker's Formula for Change and can create and articulate your unique selling proposition, you're going to stand head and shoulders above your competition. All right. At, now that we've generated a lead, what next? I will say this. Most business owners actually fail at this part right here. I cannot tell you how crucial this part is right here because generating leads is easy. <laughs> Following up with them and getting an appointment is the more difficult part. And a lot of the reasons why business owners don't do it is because, let's face it, we just get too busy. Uh, you know, the average business owner or business developer only follows up with their prospects or customers two times. It takes between 7 and 11 times to actually get that meeting. So let me kind of walk you through the lead nurturing and appointment setting process. So here are some key principles. Number one is to use the marketing equation. The marketing equation is a very simple framework on how to craft your messages to communicate your value proposition to your customers or prospects or suspects or leads in this case. The marketing equation has four parts. The first is interrupt. You must be able to identify with somebody's pain point. For example, are you sick and tired of having the right people leave the business? Are you frustrated with uh, how hard it is to find the right people for your business? Um, are you frustrated with how much you pay in taxes? Um, uh, is, is the amount of work that you have in your engineering department stressing you out? So you've got to be able to identify with your target market. That's why it's so important, y'all, to identify exactly who your target market is and know everything about them. What are their pain points? What are their challenges? What do they want? What are they looking to accomplish? What are they looking to achieve? 
If you know those things, the marketing equation is very simple. So that so number one is to interrupt them by identifying with their challenge or pain point. Number two is to um, is to engage. The way to engage them is by showing them what their life could be like by actually using you. This is kind of sounding like Lacker's formula for change, isn't it? The first thing I need to do is relate to their dissatisfaction. Then I need to engage them by showing them what their vision could look like by using your product or service. And then what I'm going to do is then the third step is to educate them. What is it about your company? What is it about your products and services that makes you different and unique? And you want to make sure that you use benefit-rich language, not feature-rich language. Benefit-rich language is when you communicate how you make somebody else's life better. So, for example, if you say, I can help you grow sales 20%, that's a benefit. If you say that I can help you find the right people for your business, that's a benefit. If you say I can help uh, uh, your business explode in growth, that's a benefit. A feature is when you're talking about yourself. I've been in business for 20 years. I've got great service. We're ISO 9000 certified. That's all fine and dandy. But within the educate point, you want to make sure that you tie your feature to a benefit. Like you can say that, hey, we've been in business for 20 years which means that you can count on us to be there if you have an issue down the road. Or if you uh, are ISO 9000 certified, you can say we're ISO 9000 certified, which means that an independent third party has uh, certified us that we can get your project done on time and on budget. So you always want to tie a feature to the benefit. And the last thing that you want in every single thing that you send to your prospects or your customers, you want to end it by having an offer. It can be an offer to download a white paper. It can be an offer to go to a webinar like you are in right now. It can be an offer to uh, go to your website. It can be an offer to have a call with you. Every single thing that you do must have an offer at the end because the worst thing that you can do to your leads, by far in my opinion, is to give them the recipe for success and not make them an offer to engage with you. That, to me, I think is just an absolute crime. The second thing is you want to focus on education-based marketing. You want to be able to follow up with your leads every week for at least 7 to 11 weeks by providing them information using Glyker's Formula for Change and the marketing equation to incentivize them or motivate them to actually take you up on your offer, whatever that might be. So you want to market through information and let that person decide whether or not they want to engage with you or not. Number three is like we talked about already. In order to follow up with them successfully, just to get a meeting, you have to follow up with them at least 7 to 11 times to get a meeting. That's just the facts. The, I, I've seen that number every single year. The Association of Marketing uh, Professionals comes out with a study, and it doesn't change. I almost think that they kind of maybe just copy it from one year to the other, but they actually confirm it each year, and the number stays exactly the same, 7 to, 7 to 11 follow-ups after you generate the lead. And then you've got to have a CRM system. Um, now, a CRM system, you don't have to go out there and spend twenty-five dollars or $50,000 on Salesforce. It can be a spreadsheet. You've got to have a way to say, okay, here are the leads. Here's the last time that I contacted them. Here's the method that I contacted them, either email or phone. Here's what we discussed. And here are the next steps. And here's the next time that I'm going to contact them. If you just got that information, you're golden because it keeps all of your leads organized and it keeps you disciplined to make sure that you actually follow up with those leads. So what are the components of a sales and marketing team? Because we've got a couple of different things going on here, right? We've got the lead generation system. We've got the follow-up system to those leads. Then we've got the appointment setting system. Then we've got the selling system where an outside sales person or yourself goes out there and closes them. And then we've got somebody to remarket to your existing clients. So here's what we found to be the components of a very successful business that's growing quickly. First is a content creator. If we're going to share information with our prospects or our leads, I actually use those two terms interchangeably. I know that there's some differences that are very subtle, but for now I use those terms interchangeably. Somebody has to create the content to communicate your value proposition and educate your prospects on why they should have a meeting with you. Remember, the purpose of a follow-up process in business-to-business -business sales is to educate your prospects on why they should do business with you. So you need a content creator. Number two, you need a graphic designer to create uh, you know, your reports or your case studies. You want to make it look professional. Every time that somebody gets information from you, it is a reflection of the quality of service and product that you deliver. 
Number three is to have a lead generation system. Are you going to use Facebook or LinkedIn to communicate your message to your target market? What's that system going to be? Number four, you have to have an email delivery system. Now, a lot of people say, well, gosh, Charles, I get three to 500 emails a day. Uh, why would I open this one? Well, an email delivery system, if all it does is it keeps your name in front of your prospects on a week by week basis, it may not feel like it at the time and you might get actually burned out by it because you've done it, you know, seven to 10 times. But if you keep your name consistently in front of the right people and speak their language, which again, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to define your market. But if you can speak to them in a meaning, meaningful manner, they will open that email. Um, the average delivery rate for across the industry for emails, not delivery rate, the average open rate across the industry for emails is 15%. Ours is consistently anywhere between 31 and 40%, not only for ourselves, but also for our clients as well, because we're speaking directly to their target market on matters and issues that are important to them. Number five is sales development representative. We actually call them SDRs. Those are people that open up the email that have not taken action on your offer to call and actually set an appointment. Very, very crucial, critical role. Six is an inside sales rep. Those are the people that are responsible for remarketing and for letting your current clients and inactive clients know about all the different services that you can provide them that would be of use to them. And the last thing, of course, is an outside sales rep. I define an outside sales rep as a person who is responsible for bringing in new clients. I define an inside sales rep as somebody who is in charge of talking to or marketing to your existing customers and talking to them or educating them on the different other products and services you can provide. So you need a content creator, a graphic designer, a lead generation system, an email delivery system, sales development rep to set appointments, inside sales rep to remarket to your existing clients, and an outside sales rep to close new deals. All right. So. Let's talk real quickly here, and uh, in about five minutes here, I'll open up for questions, but there are five segments that every business has. Number one, there are clients. You can also call these customers, and I would actually say that these are loyal customers. In other words, if they have an issue with whatever it is that you do in your business, they wouldn't think about thinking about going to anybody else except for you. That is a client. So everything that they do, they do with you. Number two are customers, or what I call transactional clients. You might, transactional clients or transactional customers are those that do some of their business with you, but not all of it. Like, for example, if you own an accounting firm, well, you can do our audit business, but I've got somebody else to do my tax business. Or, you know, um, well, I'll take care of your back office accounting, but I've got somebody else who takes care of all of my taxes and my audits. So it's where you don't have the entire wallet share. Now, I know that there are rules, especially in accounting or financial services, that there are certain things that are... Uh, a faux pas to be able to do for a client. So, you know, you know your business better than I do. So take that uh, into consideration when you're defining trying to do more business with your existing clients. But they are transactional customers. Number three is centers of influences. Center of influences are people that know the types of clients that you want to work with that can make introductions. Those are called center of influences. Number four are prospects. Prospects are people that have heard your marketing message and are interested in learning more about your company or interested in having a meeting with you. Those are prospects. And number five are suspects. What, and the reason why I put this up here as I did, uh, clients, customers, center of influence, process, and suspects, is that is also the order in which you should market. Number one, are you taking care of your clients? Do they know the other different products and services you can offer them that would make their life easier? If you're telling me that you, that you have 50 customers and all 50 of them know exactly what you do, and I've already offered it, great, move on to number two, which is customers. How can we convert our transactional customers or transactional clients into doing 90 to 95%, if not 100% of their business just with us? So that's customers, because at the end of the day, y'all, the easiest people in the world to sell are people that are already using your services or have used it in the past. Those are by far the best clients to have. Protect home base first, before you go out there and get new territory. Centers of influence. I always love marketing to a pool. A pool is basically I can market to one person and they can refer me 10 clients. So for example, in my business, I work with a lot of business brokers that refer me business and I refer them business as well because a lot of people come to them wanting to sell their business for $2 million and it's not even worth half that. So those are great prospects for us. So um, 
those are center of influence where one person can get you entry or make introductions to a pool of trusted people. Four are prospects. Prospects are people that are not your client, have never done business with you, but have expressed an interest at, at some level of doing business with you. And suspects is going out there and getting a list of a thousand people that fit your target market or a thousand companies that uh, uh, fit your target market and then start sending messages to them. So before you go out there and get any brand new customers, first ask yourself, are my clients doing all their business with me? What can I do to convert my customers into clients? And how can I use my center of influence and my existing clients to generate referrals for my business? Once you've done that, then go after brand new business. But don't do it before then because we all have limited time and resources. Let's use it where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. So here's a great fact. If you just did nothing else, nothing else, then market to your customers and convert your, your, your transactional customers or transactional clients into customers, multiple studies have shown that the average growth rate over 12 months is 22%. You haven't done any pay-per-click campaign. You haven't marketed to anybody new. Yet, if you just did those two things, you would grow your sales by 22%. No problem. So now let's talk about sales conversion. Almost finished up here in just a second. So there's four steps to, to sales conversion. Number one is discovery. Number two is making effective presentations. Number three is overcoming objections. Number four is asking for the business. I'm going to spend all the, the rest of the next two minutes on the real key to uh, discovery. It's asking great questions. Who, what, when, where, and why? Because so many businesses go in or so many sales teams and entrepreneurs go into their uh, prospect's office or start the phone call by wanting to have a presentation or a sales pitch or a pitch book. I've been in business for 22 years in multiple different businesses and I've yet to ever have nor have any desire to create a pitch book. I think the greatest pitch book in the world is a piece of paper and a pen with questions on it to ask your prospects. Because how can you prescribe medicine to somebody when you don't even know what they're suffering from? So really come to them with these questions, asking them, where are they now? Where would they like to get to? What created the challenges? And start asking yourself, how can I fix this prospect's issue or this customer's issue? That is absolutely the key. If you just get this one slide right in your selling system, asking the right questions and writing down the answers, closing them is easy. Look at a waiter. A waiter comes to you. They don't come to you and say, hello, Mr. Smith. I'm assuming that you're going to have a glass of wine. You're going to have a steak with a load of baked potato and cheesecake for dessert. No. What is the first thing they do? They say, can I get you something to drink? Uh, would you be interested in listening to our specials today? Uh, what, you know, uh, would you like to hear our specials? So they start asking questions. And then if they're a decent waiter or waitress, they actually bring you what you want. We always get perturbed when somebody comes to us and just starts putting stuff down or gives us the wrong plate. That just irks us. It frustrates us. The reason it does is because somebody is not giving you what it is that you want. So the most important thing when it comes to the sales conversion process is have you done a good job of assessing the patient's needs? That's key. So why is it that people do not buy? There's actually just seven reasons. Number one is apathy. Number two is excess uncertainty. Number three is loss of face. Number four, more work. Number five, concerns over competency. Number six, ripple effects. What happens if I make this change and it doesn't work out? And past resentments. If you ask your questions well and design them against these seven reasons people don't buy, your chances for success are exponentially better than having any pitch book or not understanding what these seven reasons are. So that is absolutely key. Okay? So making effective presentation then should be the easy part. Tie the business challenge to the solution. Keep it simple. Give them social proof as to how this has worked for other people or other similar industries in the past. And it's done. And then finally, ask for the order, which only 37% of salespeople do. Think about that for a second. You've done the lead generation. You've done the follow-up. You've had the discovery meeting. You sent them a proposal. Yet still, only 37% of the people ask for the order. That is just, that just makes me want to throw up. So in summary, number one, know the score. If you don't know where your business stands right now, that's a great first step. Do not start any lead generation campaign or selling campaign unless you know exactly where you stand right now. Number two, define your 12-month objective. 
Number three, generate your lead generation system by knowing who your target market is, what your message is using Glycker's formula for change, and which method you're going to use to deliver your message to your target market. Number four, create your lead nurturing and appointment setting process. Once they become a lead, create the seven to 11 follow-ups on a weekly basis in order to educate them on why they should meet with you and then have your callers call to set the appointment. And then number five, have your sales conversion system that is question-based to where you can tie their challenge to what it is that you're looking to accomplish. Now, this may or may not have sounded extremely overwhelming to you, okay? But now you do have a choice. You can either go do this on your own, which means say, hey, Charles, you know, this is great. All I needed was Glacker's Forming for Change. I'm going to go implement that. If one thing in this really resonated with you in this webinar, don't wait more than 48 hours to implement it. Do it now. Do it within the next 48 hours. Say, look, you know what? I think we've got all these systems in place. All I need to do is refine our value proposition. Use Glacker's Forming for Change and change it. That's great. If this sounded too overwhelming for you, we actually, this is actually what we do. We're in the business of generating leads, nurturing leads, and setting appointments on your behalf so that you don't have to go out there and hire those six people because we already have. So if that is something that you're interested in, we actually have made some time slots available. Uh, the only cost for it is your time and mine, uh, which by the way, my time is the only asset that I have in life that I cannot get back. So if you're looking to kick the tires, if you're just you know, cursory interested in growing your business, please do not set an appointment with me. I've got too many people that I can serve that really want to grow their business. But if you do, all you've got to do, and by the way, when you call me, it's going to be a blunt conversation, no sales pitches. We'll get clarity on what the next steps are, and I will ask you to make a decision, not necessarily whether you're going to do business with us, but what is it you're going to do to improve your own business. If you do want to book a call, simply go to inbound.cornerstonebusinesscoaching.com forward slash schedule. Uh, that, is a, that is an actual link to my own schedule, which I will send to all of you all on the call today to where you can schedule a 60-minute uh, call with me. Having said that, I went a little bit over. I've got 15, 20 minutes to answer any and all questions you might have. Are there any questions on what I just covered that specifically applies to you? Or is there any clarity that you would like on what we just discussed? I'll go ahead and unmute everybody. Okay. You can also ask a question through uh, uh, go to go to webinar as well. Any questions? No questions at all. I was that clear. Any questions? Okay, I'll give you about another minute to uh, ask any question you might have. Don't be shy. John, do you have a question? All right, so no questions. Um, I hope that th this was an extremely good use of your time. Uh, if you'd like to discuss more about uh, how to get your business up to the next level, uh, either take uh, within the next 48 hours something that we have discussed and uh, implement it, or if you'd like some feedback or some help, uh, simply go to inbound.cornerstonebusinesscoaching.com forward slash schedule. And I'd be happy to speak with you. I know that these fill up very, very quickly. So uh, go to NAC now. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was incredibly valuable for you. And we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.